we'll get started. I'm going to introduce Ms. Georgia. Uh, so Georgia is a licensed professional counselor. She works with both individuals and families. Uh, she believes that education and communication can open many doors and change perspectives for those who are struggling. She holds a or she holds degrees from both the University of Texas at Tyler and Texas A&M Commerce in school and community counseling. So she's going to be presenting to us um, TBRI and some things about that. Uh, she's going to be showing us some videos, and I'm going to try to make that a smooth transition as possible. So I want to introduce Ms. George Beard. Wherever you go. Okay, so this is good to go. Oh, it's nice to see lots of faces that I know and uh, and meet some new ones. Um, as I was telling someone, I was a CASA in the dark ages when Ruth Blake was the, the judge that signed it all in. So I don't know even how long that was, but but then I got super busy with it anyway. And uh, I'm one of those people that never stops going to school and then they you know, took off for a while. Um, Nice to meet you. I love it, Casa. Uh, I, uh, my practice just kind of built out of being in a children's home, and then Judge Clark pulled me this direction, and and before I knew it, I was really involved with the court. In fact, that was if those of you who knew me, it was probably seventy five to eighty percent of of my practice, and uh, really learned about. How we have to help these families. Now I know we have a lot of foster families we help, but we also have bio families, and and so Casa was the only consistent piece of the children's lives that I worked with. Now, hopefully, and most of the time, the attorneys were as well. But you you know they might be sent off to they were uh, depending on whether judge sent them. So. You know, I don't have to tell you what a key part you are to these children who have no consistency in their life. And so thank you. And I, I'm just pleased to be able to share anything I know. Uh, in an hour and a half, it's going to be a little bitty bit. Anyone here know TBRI? You know what that means? It's just trust-based relational intervention. I love that you have trust by the door as we came in, I touched that because that's so important. If we can't build trust, we can't build relationships. And so it's what you all are doing and um, how many of you are have done this for three or more years? And so those are the people that know how important and the rest of you are really starting to develop that. That is just number one, right in our families. Uh, as I was talking to my daughter, who everyone in my family, has been TBRI trained. My husband and I speak TBRI. Uh, my daughter, who was an educator, she's now doing training. Um, to, I, my sister, who we are, everybody I can get into training goes for the week on training because it's a way we communicate. It's not just, uh, this isn't something you're just going to, you know, it's a child development thing and you're going to use with kids. It is the way we should be communicating with anyone. Um, we even, she even talked about a Walmart incident she had last week. So, so that's another reason I like it. One of the main reasons is that Karen Purvis just spoke to me. I, I started working with Karen uh, when in 2007 when she was developing this, and she I worked in an institute, I worked at Bowles Children's Home, and she used us to develop this, and so I really became integrated from a very deep way. And I promised her we'd keep doing this as long as I could when she got sick and left the earth. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm, I'm always thankful to share. So today what I want to do is just give you an overview. And I'm going to let Karen talk to you and some other folks, not just me, um, so that you, we really get a good background of what PBRI is and how we want to use it. And we will have some, I'll certainly have question time. Um, I, I tried to give you just some basic information. So your handout is, is real as we go through this, you'll see there's there's so much. I know you guys know because you get good training, obviously. So some of this may be repetitive. I'd like to start with, um, okay, 
I'm gonna, this was a video too. I forgot that you can get a flight. Um, I forgot. We can make it. This is really cool. Now, I want to tell you that everything I put on this PowerPoint is online. And, uh, there's, I believe I gave you a list of TBRI clips that I put that in there. And if I didn't, uh, I will send that to uh, Jerry. There's multiple, and they're great for you to share with your, your parent, any caregiver you have, because they're like two to seven minutes. There's one on manipulation and lying. Uh, little things that are going to most of these are kind of funny. Um, and um, oh, there's probably 13 or 14 of them. And I've got them on a, I made a little grid so that you know how long they were and, and exactly what they will share. Um, we know that children hard places, oh, 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 I'm sorry, cover that. Anyway, or, you know, because you're working with these, they have a, a lot of different behaviors that maybe you were not used to. I was talking to a therapist yesterday who I'm, I'm her supervisor, and we're talking about kids don't just do this because they want to. It's the end of the school year, and they're acting out, and we've got to look at why. Any kiddo that's been through any trauma, and, and I want to, you know, trauma is big to the person that's dealing with it, right? So just assuming that, well, they just, I just can't remember them. Family, nobody abused them. That's grief. Every time the kid visits with, with the parent and back again, that's grief. So we're hitting grief every single time there's transition. Okay, so that's a trauma. And I don't know about you, but I, I had a I came from a very dysfunctional family, but I would have never wanted to be pulled out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in, in as my oldest son said, when the world was black and white. And so we didn't even have a system like this, but probably would have been removed. And you know what? Probably should have been, but it would have been painful. Uh, fortunately, I had some family that took care of that. So uh, uh, you may have some other trauma that you're thinking of, but it, it, do not, and I'm not saying you do, but a lot of people will minimize it. Well, they just got to get over it. Well, there are, children are adaptable, and they are. That doesn't mean they're not adapting through grief and pain and nightmares, right? And whatever sensory issues, I know you probably see a lot of that with the kids you work with, a lot of that. Um, and so as I said, many traditional parenting methods are not effective. I'm gonna tell you that I threw all of this away <laughs> and retrained my children, the, my grandchildren, <laughs> that I made a lot of boo-boos with and I had to say, please don't do that. So um, I'm just, I think because sometimes with traditional parenting, we're not really looking at the need Except right now, I need you to be quiet, right? That's real too. I'm not saying that's not real, but sometimes um, you just need to eat that or whatever. Um, our poor children have to hear this all the time. Okay, so we're ready for that? Yeah. Give it a shot. What am I supposed to be pointing at? Okay. And make sure everything is all here. Try trust based relational yes, intervention okay. has at its core. It, it is. This is just, this is one of the clips. Uh, there's a clip like this. There's several of the little drawing clips for better uh, that are. Uh, Useful building a trusting relationship. About the ideal response. It has three sets of that. principles. Are very short and mm -hmm. succinct. All right. Let's start it over full screen. Okay. Let's try. TBRI, trust based relational intervention, has at its core building a trusting relationship. It has three sets of principles, and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries, and I say, Yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places. And for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, 
eye contact and I give words. I am going to empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, well, those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. If this child didn't have this experience, that child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered, first by knowing they're safe, second by nutrient-rich foods, third by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion, and fourth by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior. Correcting means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. Lots in there. So thinking about what it, what it is, the, the journey, uh, as it said, the, the grief, the loss, many of you suffered loss. We just, within a, about a five-year period, my husband and I lost all our parents just to different things. And, and that was years ago. I mean, it's been about 10 years ago. And I still feel it. I still think about it. I still talk to them, right? Mm -hmm. They're with me. So as adults, we, I have a lot of tools to use when I when I feel lost, but children don't. And that's what I can't say that enough because I don't think it's respected in our system. Not, not, you know, I know people are busy, but we cannot underestimate that damage and, and the, the grief factor of behavior. So just pulling that in. Um, again, this is a process. Good, bad news is this stuff damages the brain. And you know, if we have too much of it, we have a brain that's almost impossible to heal. I never say it's impossible, but we know some, some things are hard to get back from. But the good news is as they change and as we use different methods, especially this, this changes the brain for good. So we get new pathways, neural pathways. So they learn, um, oh, I am, I can trust. But that's going to take lots of lots of journeys. Karen said before, poor family. I don't I hope it doesn't take that many. But, you know, if we think about how many times we pick up our baby and we love them and we look at them in a, in a day, and then you multiply that. Uh, I have a 50-month-old grandson, and it has just been wonderful. My son will call and say, Mom, is this right? I'm like, TBRI, are we doing it right? And I'm like, oh, everything's good. Because you can see him on this journey, you know. Fortunately, Lord willing, he will not have any, any of the big traumas. But... I have one grandson that does. So this is really big. We've had to use TBRI. He's 17 now. On his way to college, didn't they? That's the other thing that sold me on this was I was working with a 17-year-old that had, we had six months to get to life. And he had, he was on a set, he was seven. He was 17 going on seven. And when we started, and Karen was there and she started pulling things out. She gave him a weighted blanket. We did all these things. And, and this guy, I just saw him on Facebook this morning. You know, he has a business now. He is able to function. And before he was not, because he didn't trust anyone. There was no one in his life that had come through for him. And so 
uh, we were going to have a, probably a, a guy visiting the prison system a lot. I have to announce good news, and some of you may already know this, but Texas juvenile justice systems are all to your item. And if you could see their video of what, I, we just watched a video at training of these this room full of young men, um, and they tied balloons around their ankles, and they had a pop the balloon contest. Uh, I was telling my husband about it. He he worked in this arena with me a long time. And um, he was like, what, what would that do if you get big boys agitated that have a criminal justice brain right now? We'd have fights, right? But one of the kids noticed that there was some agitation and he used their code word and they all stopped and they did some breathing. They blew in their suit. They, they did a lot of calming things, and then they, they asked everybody if they were ready. Were you re this is not ready. This is ready. When everybody was ready, they started again, and they did it until there were two left that just couldn't pop all together, so they were the winners. That changes the brain. These young men who had no regulation now have self-regulation. They know, I'm getting a little elevated. i got to pause here. What will that do in your life? Can you imagine the difference? In, and recidivism is just, I don't even know the numbers, but it's super low. Okay, so I, I get too much. I, I can spend a whole day just on PDI. So, but let's get on to the, the next thing. I think this is supposed to be. So, yeah, okay. Uh, this is someone just talking about what happens to the brain. And uh, again, this is, on, this is one of the clips. I tried to pull the ones that were there and easy for you to. Right. Um, which is it's going to explain what's happening in these brains in a lot more detail. That is awesome. Have you heard of Dan Siegel and um, parenting from the inside out? Yeah, she worked. Yeah, that, that it's good stuff. Oh, I didn't do that. Did I? No, no, you're good. <laughs> uh, but it's just going to explain more about um, because again, we it takes twice or more as many positive interactions to undo those negative. If anyone has ever remodeled the house, the unmodel is harder, right? And getting all of that out is harder than putting the new stuff in. And that's what we're doing with the first parts of our positive interactions with them. We're, we're just getting rid of some of the old stuff, which makes it a lot more time intensive, but if we will stick with it, if you've ever remodeled a house before, you know, you're like, whoa, this is awesome. And that's what we feel for the kids, or I do. If we can't do that. As recently as the 1980s, Scientists believed a child's brain at birth was fairly static, largely predetermined by genetics. Researchers now know that's not true. While genetics clearly play a role, scientists know that relationships and experiences shape the brain. Think of a developing brain like a multi-storied house under construction. In this chapter, will explore the basics of brain development and help you understand how early traumatic experiences can design a different house. When we're born, our brains are teeming with more than 100 billion neurons or brain cells. Under optimal conditions, when our needs are met consistently by nurturing caregivers, we got a red ball. our brains thrive. These neurons connect in complex and vast networks much like the electrical wiring in a modern home. The baby comes with all this wiring, but it's the human interaction, looking into the eyes, being held, hearing the song of my mother, feeling the strong shoulder of my daddy, that begin to make the brain develop in very, very important ways for all of the life skills that will come. At birth, the lower floors, or the downstairs part of the brain, is firmly wired in place by genetics, allowing a child to breathe, eat, sleep, and hear. Survival functions are rooted here. Very few connections in the upper floors are formed. These more sophisticated parts of the brain govern higher functions, 
complex thought, reasoning, emotional processing, memory, speech, and most importantly, the ability to regulate our behavior. It takes time and repeated experiences for this circuitry to develop and become hardwired in the brain. When a child experiences trauma, abuse, neglect, or other risk factors, it can skew the wiring of the brain, as well as the structure and the chemistry. The lower, more primitive survival part of the brain can overdevelop from reacting to fear, while the critical upper floors may underdevelop and suffer. In the book that I wrote with Dan Siegel, The Whole Brain Child, we talk about an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. For some kids... Dr. Bryson is a psychotherapist at Pediatric and Adolescent Psychology Associates, Director of Parenting Education for the Mindsight Institute in California, and best-selling author along with Mindsight Executive Director, Dr. Dan Siegel. The upstairs brain is the more sophisticated part of the brain. It's our cortex that takes a long, long time to develop. And it's the part of the brain that allows us to regulate our emotions and calm down our bodies, understand ourselves, understand other people, and really be able to make good choices and be flexible and adaptive. The downstairs brain is much more primitive. It's actually really well developed at birth. And it's the limbic area and the brain stem connected to the body. And that part of the brain is much more reactive. And its job is to kind of constantly be watching for how to keep us alive. <clears throat> Dr. Bryson's research and studies in attachment science, child rearing theory, and interpersonal neurobiology have made her a sought after expert contributor with appearances on Good Morning America, PBS, and Red Book Magazine. She says trauma triggers the watchdog part of the lower brain, called the amygdala, to work overtime. And its job is to constantly sort of scan the environment, to be paranoid a little bit, to be watching, is, is everything okay here? Am I okay? Am I safe? Is anyone out to get me? Can I relax? And that part of the brain is always appraising what's going on around us, reading faces, reading the environment. Do you like bubblegum? Yeah. No. When children feel threatened or overwhelmed with fear, they may fight, run away, or shut down. The brain kicks into survival response, which researchers called fight, flight, or freeze survival mode. If the brain stays in this state too long because of trauma, it reorganizes around survival at the expense of healthy development of other parts of the brain. So for a child who's had repeated exposure to fearful experiences, whether those be sort of a trauma like a car accident, or whether it's developmental or relational trauma, where the caregiver was frightening, or they were left for long periods of time to manage their own fear states. The downstairs brain has gotten a lot of practice being active. It's the repeated experiences that we have that actually activate growth and connection in the brain. So if a child has had a lot of experiences where their downstairs brain that was reactive and fearful, that part of the brain gets really well developed. Whereas then the upstairs brain that knows how to calm that fear and kind of do that self-soothing like, oh, that was a scary noise, but I'm okay now. That part of the brain may not be as well developed in children who have had repeated fearful experiences. The impact goes beyond the upper and lower floors. The fear and stress of trauma also affect the left and right hemispheres of the brain, which help coordinate logic and emotion. The left brain specializes in logical, literal, linear, and linguistic, which is using words, in those modes of processing information and going about in the world. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, is much more closely connected to emotion, to sensations in our bodies, to kind of looking at the whole picture as opposed to bits and pieces, and more random ways of, of processing information as opposed to linear. And the important part is that they work together as a coordinated whole. When children are in situations where their needs are not responded to, where their emotional states are not understood, or there is not a caregiver who responds consistently, quickly, and in an attuned way, the right hemisphere does not get nurtured. It doesn't get developed optimally. So when one side takes over, we can either be cut off from our emotions or we can become flooded by them. It's not just our emotional balance that gets upset by trauma. It also disturbs the delicate balance between our brain chemistry and the hormones that drive our central nervous system and our entire being. 
In times of stress, our bodies produce the hormone cortisol, revving our bodies to a state of high alert. Periodic stress and short bursts of cortisol actually stimulate growth and help us adapt and change. When stress stays too high for too long, toxic levels of cortisol become corrosive and can lead to a host of long-term problems. Rockefeller University neuroscience professor Dr. Bruce McEwen is noted for his pioneering work on the impact of stress on the brain. In a chronic stress situation, our lab has shown that, that, that dendrites in some parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop it. This is, you can say a lot. <laughs> um, he's going to talk about how, uh, as we get older, that that explains a lot of our physical issues. Um, Kaiser Permanente in California did this research that to find out why people, you know, in certain age groups are developing heart disease or diabetes or whatever illnesses because this is an insurance company. So how can we keep this from happening? And what they found was early childhood trauma develops. Uh, uh, and, and of course that usually continues with us because we're usually, you know, Austin are in families, you know, some of the families that our kids come from that generationally have these issues. And so because of the chemistry that happens with fear and stress, it starts to build up in your body. In fact, some people actually use up all their adrenaline when they've had to be in super, extremely traumatic settings like our first responders and things like that. We use, we use this with them too, so that they can learn how to calm when they may not have the chemistry for calming. And that's, that's part of what happens with our kids is their, their chemistry, uh, one of the things that when we did camps at TCU, they did a spit test it right at the beginning. They did a spit and little thing and they, they sent off their, their spit and found out what their neurochemistry was. And of course it would just be, well, we all had to do it too. And ours wasn't so great either, but it would <laughs> all over the place. One after the second week, it had changed a little But by the third week of coming to camp four days all day long with a buddy and really intense TBRI, their neurochemistry was starting to balance. Now, again, we have some kids that their cortisol may be so out of whack that it's going to take a lot and or it may, they may have to learn to deal with that. Just like some of us do, we have a higher stress level maybe than someone else. Uh, but, it, but because they were building trust, the, their caregivers were learning how to do this because they're part of camp. And it just, it makes a big difference of how our brains work. You saw that about fear. What are some other things you're seeing that are fear responses in kids? Anybody have that a lot? I don't think I put fear stuff on there, did I? Um, you know, there's extrovert, there's external fear response. So that's, you know, the throwing down. The grandson that I worked that I had to deal with None of my children ever had a throw down in anywhere. I don't know why it's not because I'm a perfect parent. I'll just tell you that now. Mm -hmm. But when my little grandson who had experienced some trauma did, fortunately, I had two. I just saw him floor with him. And Grandpa left. And uh, I'm sitting there and using everything I had. And that's when I went, wow. Because I had never, my husband had, and I had been foster parents. We were house parents and I, with some at-risk adolescents. I have an adopted child, not that she was a challenge, but uh, never saw that. So um, X, if we see those, those well, I say they're easier to deal with. To me, you should, you're showing me what's going on right here. So I can get down there with you and we can, I can talk calmly and I can say, use my voice to and really get down. What was it that you're talking about that you saw in your grandson, but you didn't see well, I, I missed that part. I had never had a child that just threw a wall I'd fit mm -hmm. personally. Not that I, had, especially in a store. Isn't that harder? I, I talk to parents all the time because what happens? Everybody comes around you with advice, right? And and stares at you, and that makes the child worse. So I had to get down on the floor on his level 
and get where he was and use my calm voice. My brain wasn't calm, but I used my calm voice to say, I'm right there with you until you're finished, and we're going to be okay. What I wasn't going to do was father the way he wanted. I didn't want to with all my heart, but I wasn't going to do that because that's not what but the need was right to advise. And we're always looking for the need. This is the 17 year old that now is, he is a star baseball player. I mean, he is, he's at our house, and all you have to do is tell him, I want this done, and it's done like three times like what I would do. <laughs> he's got this amazing brain. Isn't that the way we see our kids that have a lot of this fear behavior? Some of them have the most amazing brains. And if we can see through the fear response and get to what's really in there, we can use that brain so much. It's amazing. Um, the other, the hard part for me, and, and I don't know how you feel about it, but it's the internal response where I'm not going to talk. You can't make me eat. I, I dealt with a little guy at the children's home. He was a diabetic and he refused to take his insulin. We had to call an ambulance a lot. Because if you refuse your, I mean, he was, he was 12 years old. He's pretty strong. Um, you're not going to force someone to shoot insulin. So um, he grew up, learned how to do his own insulin. But in that moment, that was the only thing he could hold on to that gave him some control in his very out of control life. So what was the need? Control. And until we let him learn how to get that, we were not going to get anywhere with him. Because again, that's when it's a health issue, then that's when you really have to work, right? Okay, um, lots of changes. But again, what we're going to, to look at now is some things that maybe will help. Okay. Um, what, what TBRI aims to do, okay, is we, we first we want to empower. Um, so we are going to look at, Empowering can be, you know, meeting that need of what Karen used to say every two hours, you need hydration, nutrition, and activity. Now, we also want to add that sensory. That activity may be sensory. You've got fidgets, you've got candy, bubble gum is calming. Um, if you've got a kiddo that doesn't want to wear um, nylon, whatever those that stuff is that they, he shouldn't have to, because that's all he's going to be thinking about. Now, some of them only want to wear that. You know, this 17-year-old wore this until two years ago. He has had a girlfriend who asked him to, to wear dress pants to an event, and he wore dress pants. And I just got pictures everywhere of this. And now he's okay with that, and he's learning even more of pair of blue jeans. He was 16 before he went from a pair of blue jeans. So if you think about the sensory element of blue jeans, when he was very little, he didn't want to wear underwear. Don't wear them. Just don't worry, you know, just make sure you keep shorts up all day. Uh, because when a kiddo is dealing with, with any response that, that triggers that amygdala, all of our sensory stations are right by our amygdala. So if we're having troubles with any sensory issue, be it smell or anything, uh, vestibular, so movement. If, if you have you ever seen kids that want to move all the time, or Miss Georgia? You know, that helps us feel calmer. You see people that rock, that's a calming thing. What do we do with our babies when they're upset? We do this or we do this, right? How many nights have you spent going to? Right? Because it's that vestibular sense that needs needs to be, I always say, wound up. We gotta, gotta get them wound up, they're unwound. And so it looks like they're wound up, but what's happening is inside, it's not working. Okay, so proprioceptive. In, uh, sensory issues are dealing with touch, deep muscle. So those kiddos that when you uh, touch them, they say, stop hitting me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and and they, they, a kiddo, somebody else can bump, just barely touch them in school and they're ready to fight. Because if you touch me and that signals pain or fear, I'm ready to fight because that is one of our fear responses, right? Kids that just go, like that, that's a fear response that we got to teach them how to not do it, but it's not usually malicious. I'm not saying it in some time, but it's with our kids, it's usually that yeah. I've got to protect myself, right? It could be that I need big hugs. Have you had those kids that run up to you and hug you so big they nearly knock you down because they need those hugs? And so we have to say, always say, Miss Georgia likes friends. Because so I love hugs, but I don't want to. I've had kids really, you know, hurt me because most of these kids.
kids are bigger than me. You know, I taught even up to high school that my husband just said, I know why you teach elementary because the kids are all smaller than you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so once we've done all that and we've done this empowering, which really is always, right? You're being empowered. CASA is empowering you. They're teaching you. They're, they're providing this amazing place here for you to come and learn. And it sounds to me like they're constantly encouraging and empowering. This is amazing. I love to see all this activity because the more connected we feel to each other, so that's the next thing, empowering connects us. So once we've done all that empowering, then our connections grow stronger, but we have to do intentional things like this training, like uh, with kiddos, it's, you know, reading, or what can you find that they're like? Uh, those kids that I don't want to talk to you. Well, what do you like? I have read more of those um, dragon books, mm -hmm. and there's a series that were there's cats and dogs and you know, because I had little kid up, well, those are usually my middle schoolers that are reading those. I gotta know, I gotta scan them enough to know what they're thinking about and what they're talking about. I had a my sister just showed me some pictures of one of her children who's drawing. He's this amazing artist, and he's telling us what his needs are. He's struggling right now. And I said, look in this picture. Let's look. We connect by saying, I love your artwork. Tell me about it. And it may be the scariest thing you've ever seen in your life. Maybe they wrote a poem. It's the scariest thing you ever saw, you ever wrote. But I need to know what's that, what that's about so I can connect through that. Mm -hmm. What are, I'm so like I'll do things for families that helps them, like, you know, the father's thing that they're doing. That is amazing, uh, recognizing that. Um, I know with the kinship families I'm working with in, in Wood County, it's like they need so much support because they're getting all of the behaviors and they need to know they're doing okay, <laughs> that I'm not totally wrong and that this is not about me. This is about what's going on with that child. So that's great. That's connecting. Lots of stuff to do. And until we do empowering and connecting, the correct thing is you just you don't have any money in the bank. These two things put money in the bank, then you can draw it out. And that correcting should not be punishment, it should be discipline. Punishment, we know doesn't work, our prisons would be empty. So we're we need to be using teaching methods. And and I know that's hard. I've I've been there where it takes everything you have just to say. When you're ready, we're going to talk about what just happened because you want to go, you go to your room and shut the door and I don't want to hear your voice. You know, or I lived with 10 adolescents, at-risk adolescents, some of them just coming out of GB and stuff. And sometimes you don't want to hear what they have to say. But what they needed was for me to stop and be calm myself and then visit with them and then find out why they're mad. And you know what? Part of that is problem solving. Okay, I, I hear why you're mad. And you know what? I can understand that. Let's go talk to the adult that that happened with. And then we can all work out a plan that works. Hopefully you have adults you can do that with. That's not always, but at least you, they know you're willing to, right? Mm -hmm. Not that you're not in, not going to be have to apologize for throwing at something at them or spitting in their face. But what was going on and how can we keep this from happening? And it's possible. Again, when I saw this, what the juvenile justice system is doing, I'm like, I told one of the guys that's the lead on that, I said, this is it. This is going to change the world. If we can affect kids that are struggling to that point, and then they come out and they have healthy families, can you imagine what that's going to look like? Mm. All right. Sorry, I get real, real involved with this. So when fear's in control, uh, we're going to... Because of time, we're going to skip this, but this is one that's on there. Um, there is, there's a good one on time in versus time out, oh. because that's important. Learning that staying, oh, yeah, I'm I was going to say, I do send that fear video to everyone. Oh, yeah. Later. That would be great. And I'm going to send you that list so that you can, they can have the whole list. Yeah, of yes. Okay. Because uh, I, I get another one I saw as it was, it was up there was, you know, giving voice. This, there's just a lot understanding what's happening with our children. Um, so even when a kid I feel safe. So when we're talking about this fear, you're maybe a foster parent that uh, you provided this awesome room, and you're thinking, I bet they've never had a room this nice, and they probably haven't. They may be a slip on the floor, 
with a five other people in a room with no door on it. Whatever. Some of the worst things, right? But in your house, if you haven't established what we talked about before, there's not felt safety. So they're going to comply. They're going to get that honeymoon period. They're going to comply a little bit. But until they feel safe, so sensory needs are met, nutritional needs are met. Um, we'll talk some more about the needs. But until that's all happening, and this this right here, consistency, predictability, and appropriate levels of control, the boundaries, those have to be there. Uh, I tell kids all the time I work with, this is necessary. So you have rules because it makes your brain go, oh, I know where to go. So it's like working in a walking in a maze and you're going to be told the, the directions or you're going to be lost. So it keeps your brain focused. Um, like clutter freeze, these are some of the behaviors. Again, uh, sensory processing disorder, huge. You've seen the manipulate. The manipulation is hard because they're good at it. Manipulation is survival in their life. So I know we don't want to see it all the time. What, what we'll know is when they feel really safe, manipulation comes down. You don't need to anymore. So when they learn how to get their needs met right, whether it's even if it's negatively. Uh, I love an example, and you, there's a lot of these online because, you know, we know what we see on the surface. So um, Sammy, he's... He won't, he won't go to sleep at night. He won't sleep. He doesn't sleep. He keeps everybody up. He gets into the pantry. These are some kids I've worked with. Right? I had a kid that ate cake batter, cake mix all night, which makes your intestines turn to concrete, by the way. So, oh, gosh. But it was hard. She liked it. It felt good. She liked to taste every ingredient. She could tell you. You could put a, something in front of her and let her taste it, and she could tell you what it had in it. So it was important. It was a sensory need being met. But what was happening was fear, a lot, a lot, a lot of fear. And she was worried about her family. Her family was not with her. These kids who have to be away from their siblings, and especially the older ones, worry, worry, worry all the time, right? Allergies. If uh, if kids are sick, if they're, especially if they're real allergic, even if we don't really realize it, if our histamine level is up, our behaviors are going to be up. If you notice those kids when they take a... In a histamine, you'll see a lot of change in behavior because the histamine level is down. So it kind of works like some of the medications we use. And I know we can't use it for that, but that's kind of what it uses. So the other thing we've got to do is, is be mindful, okay? It's about us and how we approach a behavior. So if I, and I'm not going to tell you that I wouldn't have done this in my young parenting brain, that grandchild, I was to get up right now. We've got to go. Grandpa's already gone. Come on. I might have picked him up. That means I think he's doing that on purpose. I could just listen to me and I could say it loud enough. He must not be hearing me. Then he'd, he'd respond differently. But that would be the willful disobedience. So power struggle. I'm trying harder. He's resisting more. Maybe not with my grandchild because he needs me. But, but other kids have worked with. Like the little guy with the the um, diabetes, we knew we could not, could not push against him. It was just going to make it worse. I just won't eat now. I'll eat nothing. Um, so willful disobedience just causes that power struggle. If that's the way we approach it, he's just a brat. He just, he's just spoiled. You know, that's, people could say that about my grandchildren. And they are, but they still have extremely good behavior. I can say, whoa, buddy. And if I've raised my voice like that, Right, because I never yell at them. I'm always fair. I empower the victims out of them, and we're very connected. So I can ask them to do anything, right? Um, and my students were that way. I mean, you know, it's like you build that relationship with kids. I don't care what they're dealing with, and they trust you. Um, yeah, so it's a downward spiral. When we, when we look at it as a felt safety issue with children, so we approach this with, oh my gosh, there's some, I knew he was upset about a toy, but, but it's more than that, right? Because he didn't always find toys, almost always, but not always. And so getting down here and going, this kid is, is not okay. He, we learned that the announcements in Walmart were more than he could stand. Uh, a lot of noise. He couldn't be in, in place with a lot of people. So 
because I approached it from here, I gave him a voice. What's going on? What do you need? And what he told me was, I don't know. I don't know. I said, okay. Well, maybe we need to get something to drink. And, and we got into the car. And then he told us what he wanted, which was a toy. But but we talked about that. And one of the things I learned with this kiddo, he taught me so much because I was, Karen was on campus. He lived on campus. And so she was there working with us. Um, and is that if I will um, listen to what he needs to say, but I have to get those words out. And as long as I'm pushing, I'm not going to really find out what's going on. I'm only going to get fear response. And so instead of with addressing his, his felt safety, I got him up off the floor. We, we went on. We're all still best friends. Everything's good. We're good. Again, he's 17 year olds working so hard at my house. This is what I like to give everybody. And I believe y'all have a copy of this one and Erickson. These are just two theories that I've always used. I use it with my students when I talk, kids in my, in my home, whatever. Um, because it's important for us to be thinking. If we get this kind of in our head, and it goes so much with TBRI, if, if we don't have food and water, and warmth that says shelter, we can't rest. We know what going without sleep does to people. Then we're, that's it. We're not surviving. This is survival here. And you know that a lot of our kids come from inconsistency at best. Um, sometimes nothing for a while. You know, you probably have worked with some of those kids who were three and they were taking care of their infant sibling and trying to find food. And yeah. Then the safety needs. So there's structure, security. It, that's where we need consistency, predictability, and, and all of that because if that doesn't happen, I really am not very organized to know what to do next. Then we go on that belongingness. And so, so you see here's the empowering, here's the connecting, and then right there, I mean, excuse me. Yeah, and then we're doing correcting. We're doing belongingness, which means I can talk to you. We can do correcting. We can go, you know, the other day when that happened, well, let's talk about that because I have some money in the bank. And then, okay, see where esteem is and learning. And our kids, so much pressure in school. But if they don't build this, the, the, the esteem means the learning stuff is not going to happen. And I had Lindell ISD, I will tell you, I'm just going to brag because they will let me in any school except testing time. And I forget about that sometimes. Because what they think is, if we don't help these kids with their emotional issues, they're not going to learn. And no one in the classroom is going to learn, right? If you've got a kid rolling around the floor, there's no learning in that classroom except how to roll around the floor. So very important. So this one is really, to me, follows right on TBRI. Erickson just helps us realize what needs to happen with with people, because this Erickson goes down here, here's where I live, right here. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty good. I have no despair there, so I'm, I'm glad. But um, that first year, see, basic trust, mistrust. So if we don't develop that in our children early on, not that we can't teach them to trust, but it's not in eight. So I'm always going to be thinking, hmm, sometimes they're just really good at finding people that shouldn't be trusted. I'll tell you, these kids are street smart, right? So they can literally, you don't want to talk to that guy. And so, but but what's happening is, you know, when we can't just give that up and we can't totally trust people, we're not receiving as much. Uh, this, this autonomy, all of these, autonomy versus shame and, and initiative versus guilt, that's how I interact with people. Erickson is looking at social changes, social development, and how do I interact socially? So you've got a table there that shows, so what I always look at, okay, I've got a, a kid that's 17. Now this they're doing anyway, really, really doing. And that's what we have a lot with kids who, I don't know who I am, I don't know what I am, I don't know what, I, you know, I'm not, can't fit anywhere because I didn't develop all those other things. So if you've got this with all that not developed, then we got to work. We've got to think, okay, well, at four, he probably didn't get a lot of time with just playing. And I'm going to tell you, 
in our society today, a lot of that is not happening anyway. They're all, all over the place doing stuff. Kids need unfettered play, especially those early developmental years. Schools should be having that. Lots and lots and lots of play because that's what you learn. I learn how to interact with others. I learn this doesn't work. I learn physics when I'm playing. I learn basic structural brain things. So it's really important. So what I want you to use this for is if you have a kiddo that, you know, again, he's older, but we're just not seeing that he's got an, he won't try. So I'm in high school, but if there's a new concept, I'm not doing that, I'm not trying that. Well, first of all, he may not feel good, good about himself, but he also may not have the skills. So get him out there. I hope he's in sports or something and playing ball and doing things to get that brain activity going with brain with active sports and or crafts, but but really movement. We have a lot of brain change, a lot, you know, that affects reading and math and all those things. So look for those things. You can see, uh, look at this up here with three to six. We want kids that have humor, empathy, and resilience. Kids without empathy, we have this spectrum of empathy over here is I have, I'm, I'm really seriously involved with everything you want to know what they may be over involved. And over here we have murder. So these kids are losing empathy because of their life situation. That's when we have, you know, I don't care what your stuff is, I'm going to tear it up. You know, I'm going to paint whatever I want to paint, wherever I want to paint it. I'm going to take your purse because I want it or those, that's what we have. So they're missing some of these vital parts and look where that needs to develop. So, but we can go back, we can teach that. You know, uh, hopefully not maybe when they're here as easily, but we can still teach it. That 17 year old learned it and he is, he is amazing with, with young children. He, he really does well with like young children. Okay. How so, do you, can you give an example like an older child who, uh, is kind of stagnant, doesn't like activity, physical activity, like how would you initiate that with, you know, children who just, you know, want to play games all day, you know, the, oh, video, uh, games. video games and just really are not interested in physical activity. Yeah. Like what would be an avenue or how would you actually? Well, number you know, one child? is I would put structure on that video game. I, and I'll tell you, kids that come to my office and I'll say that, they'll look at me with like, how can you say that to her? You know, but we have to yeah. because they don't have it and they're very, very, very addicted. We know that. So I would be looking at, we got a, maybe a depressed kiddo yeah. that's really wanting to hide and I don't have to think about, think about, you don't have to think about world, life. Think about, I only want to know about is Fortnite. So the skins you're going to buy or something like that. But so starting with that and, and then really go get interested in this video game. <laughs> Um, you know, if I don't, I'm not saying you have to be good at it because I'm, I do not choose to, and I'm not. I'm not a technology person. What are you doing there? Let me see what you're doing, and really get involved, and and then say, hey, why don't we go do this? And then when we come back, I'm going to give you extra time or something because we know we're not going to just cut the cord on that because first of all, I can find video games everywhere, but that's not respectful either because whatever's going on in there means I can't get out here. I'm not safe out here. So just, and I know that's hard to do it a little bit. You know, if you're shaving time off, these shave off 30 minutes at a time. Or how about you do it between this time and this time? And, and we'll go do this together. There's the time in. Together. Be sure you're going to do that. You might suggest that. And that's, I'm not saying that's easy. That is not easy. It's hard to find what they want to do with you together. <laughs> that's the problem, right? Because they're pretty engaged. I'm, I'm so thankful I haven't been raised children with video games and phones. None of that existed. Our phone was on the wall with a long cord. You know, it was, we didn't have that because it's so addictive that it's hard. And especially with our kids who that, that kind of gets their brain activity involved and they do not have to fear anything. In fact, I, depending on the game they're playing, they probably feel in control. Oh, yeah. The one, you know, again, Fortnite is, I'm in control of all this stuff, right? And it's not even the shoot 'em up game. So I'm sure with those, they really do. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I know it's a huge problem. Adolescents really, well, they start early. I tell parents, don't give kids a phone until they're at least 10. 
There's ways you can do it. And I'm going to tell you, none of my grandchildren had a phone until they were 12. And it was hard, but they did survive. We just had to keep telling them that. You're going to survive. What if there's an emergency? Then tell your teacher. Just write. Um, because of what it, not because it's the phone, right? But it's right. because of what they have. So, yeah. Big stuff. Again, different world and lots of things that are triggering on the, these needs to that these kids have. You think they haven't done research on that? Oh, yes, they Attachment, um, and again, because of time, I'm just going to talk about attachment. And I know you'd rather hear other people than me, but in an hour and a half, this is a really good one. Uh, this is a family who have adopted three children and they care a lot about, they had to learn about their attachment. There is a, I don't know if you've ever heard of the AAI, it's the Adult Attachment Inventory or Interview. And uh, not that everybody needs to have that, I'm not going to tell you that, but it just helped them understand that they had some real dismissive attachment. Well, that just means that I tell you to go to your room all the time. You need to get over it. Look, you've got a good house here, and they did. They were the nice house. And you've got this, and you've got this. And so what are you complaining about? And when they learned about what they were doing to these kids who had some fear, they'd come from some real hard situations, they started coming to them, and they started saying, what do you need? This, this little guy had a disappointment at school. What do you need? What happened? Really? Well, let's go do this. And because she knew, I think it was ice cream, but something that he liked. Um, they did more together. They got, they didn't just send them to baseball practice one, you know, things like that. Mindfulness is huge. There is a, there is um lots of information out there. There, there should be a clip on mind. I know there is that Karen does on mindfulness. It just means being on a full mind, just being aware, because we have we have as many distractions as kids do, right? We, um, you know, just coming here, and I am not busy. I'm retired, basically. I don't have a practice anymore, and uh, so I don't have a college to have. But if my phone dings, I think it probably must be important. But it wasn't, but, you know, I had to pull over in case it was one of my kids or something. Uh, and... So you have that, you have work, you have, if you're here, you probably work and volunteer and all the sports you got. Thank goodness. <laughs> we like dance practice. Dance practice. Oh, yes. That's a good physical activity. There you go. Um, yeah. So when something happens, we need to help these parents understand you're busy, you're cooking dinner, you're not, everything's happening. And then bam, that's exactly when they're going to throw it, right? I've got to find a way to stop. If I don't have a partner or someone helping me, then I've got to stop. Turn the, the fire off and go, wow, what happened? Woo, what can I do for you? It will get their attention and maybe they'll just need to sit there for a while. Maybe, you want, why don't you cook? You want to help me cook? Uh, it needs to be something where we can pull ourselves out of what we would feel, which is I'm trying to cook dinner here and you're getting in my way and say, wow, something. What about cooking dinner is affecting this kid? I had to learn that. When my family came to visit us at a children's home, our kids started acting out. I, they, I belonged to them at that point. We'd been there for two years the first time that happened. I belonged to them. And here it is. Your family's coming to visit? Oh, no, they're not. <laughs> and so... You know, we would have to deal with that right there. And fortunately, my family understood, but it was, wow, I didn't think about that. I thought, oh, they're going to love my sister and brother-in-law. They're going to come with all this stuff they're going to bring them. No. And so remembering these kids, especially they establish a relationship with you even, there's going to be something, you, you've got to really be thinking about that. Maybe it's about what I'm doing. Maybe I need to have prepared them better, which is exactly what I should have done. They're going to come and we're going to eat together, but we're still going to do our nighttime stuff and we're still getting right. So that actually I left for a little bit and that was even worse. You know, I went somewhere with them for about four hours. Boy, did my husband get it. So, <laughs> but I wasn't being mindful about their needs and my job was to take care of their needs. Uh, as a parent, that's our job, right? As a caregiver, that's our job. Uh, we can figure out how to make our job easier or fight it all the time. 
but it's just real. So, um, we have to build a new language. They, they call these scripts, but what we're looking at is trying to change the way we approach something and being consistent with it. That's important. But instead of just saying no, like this, and, and bless his heart, hope he doesn't want to. This grandson that I learned so much from, he would come to my house. It was a 50 minute drive. And they would drive to our house. I live in Hideaway where you can swim, fish, boat, all this stuff. And he already had it planned out. Now, if we get there at 8 30 or 9, it's still planned out. We're going to go fishing. And he's a fisherman. He's while he's with us, he gets up in the morning and fishes and he finishes work and he goes and fishes some more. So he loved it. He's always loved it. And we would have to say, well, no, we're not going fishing tonight. He knew there was a lighted place, but it was like, I said, Gabby is just can't do it tonight. Your grandpa's going to fish with you tomorrow. Oh, no, that was not good enough. So what I had to talk to him about was, here's what you can do on your trip to our house. You get to say, I want to fish, I want to swim. These are the things we want to do. And when you get here, we're going to talk about it and we're going to write it down and plan it. And when you do that with a kid like that, you better, better do it. If you put that we're going to play games Saturday night, don't say, well, I'm too tired, or hey, we wanted to watch a movie. Oh, no, you'll play a game. If it's fish and it takes you 30 minutes or monopoly, you play that game because you promised them. That's building trust. So I had to be aware and I had to be mindful and not just get upset. But what I gave him was a yes, we can do those things, but here's how we're going to do it. No, we can't do it tonight, but we can do it tomorrow. So a yes, no, yes, a yes sandwich, Karen used to call that. So for every no, I need to give two yeses. Now, I, you know, I know sometimes that's just that we're being positive. Um, but if I'm going to say, no, you're not going out with those people, I better say, you know what? Why don't you bring them to our house and let's meet them and let's talk about it. what do you want to do? Maybe I could take you something, whatever your teenager's asking. Um, because that's a big one, right? If, you, if you've already built trust, you don't have to go through that, but sometimes we do. Showing respect, we have to model that. If I don't respect that you like to have your light on at night or you like to wear that shirt that I don't I think is ridiculous, then we're not going to get respect. I think we, do you think they don't think we look ridiculous? I always ask my daughter, is it okay if I'll go out like this? Because I respect that she's got good taste. Um, lots of compromises. Now, this does not mean you're letting kids get away with things. Compromise means, okay, you want to play a game, and tonight is nine o'clock, and I just don't think I can stick with a game. I, we could play fish, and then tomorrow play Monopoly. Or, so I'm going to compromise, and I can say, I'm not playing a game tonight, don't say anything to me about it. I can at least co have a conversation about that, right? So I'm, I'm, the compromise does not mean I'm giving in. It means we're going to work together. And when you have a real kid pushing, then that compromise, those choices and compromises need to be what you really want to happen. It just gives them several ways to do that. So we're gonna um, we're gonna go to bed now. If you want to if you want to have a little more video game time tomorrow for 15 extra minutes, I'm good with that. And then tonight we'll go to bed. And I'm going to remind you, you right? So that's a compromise. They're going. To, we're going to have a bedtime, and that is right. One of the biggest things people deal with. Uh, that's on there. There's a clip on that. Uh, this is all in my office. All this is in my hallway. We're going to stick together. So we're going to teach kids. That means I'm going to listen to you. You're going to listen to me. If you have a group, we're going to take turns listening. We have like a talking stick or something. Uh, no hurts. And that means our words hurt. It's not just physical hurts, but really explaining how when someone tells you you're stupid, how you feel and all those things. And then we're going to have fun. I mean, that's good major. We're going to always have fun. But we've got to do this before we get in fun or we're not safe. I did this with my high school English students. We're going to have fun and you're all going to make super grades. But first, these things have to happen. And here's this. And Reduce. Anybody do reduce? This is the word. This is the language of my husband and I. I think you need a redo. You must be tired. You want to say that again? <laughs> it helps because you know what? That stops me. Oh my gosh, what am I saying? 
Because when I'm tired, sometimes things come around. So and just using you're using your words, you know, and one thing you'll find when in camp, one of the first things that's gonna happen when they're using their words, the words are not present. I've heard in my office words, my children couldn't say shut up and stupid in my house. But I they don't even know all the words because I didn't know they existed. Why don't I have to learn? What does that mean? I have to go figure it out. But I need them to use their words. So if that's where they start, I can say, okay, I hear that and I can tell it. It sounds to me like you're really angry, but that doesn't tell me what your need is. So when you're finished with all that, tell me what you need. And they start catching themselves. Like, you know, they used to I could walk up with high school students and blah, 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 you know, and then whatever. Mm -hmm. And they would see me, oh, oh, Miss Georgia, how are you doing that in the talk? There was none of that in the talk. They were still using it, but not with me because that didn't work with me. I, don't, I can't help you. So really important, and most of the kids in care, no one's asked them to use their words. No one says, well, what do you really need? And if they say, I want to go home with my parents, we say, I know you do. Those are good words. So let's talk about what we can do now. We don't have to dismiss that they want to do that and that it may never happen, but we can at least listen to them because that is the biggest, probably one of the biggest needs they have. Okay. I'm going to watch that time again using script. So it's um, the tone, not too down there, the tone. Uh, be clear. Again, when we're talking, if if I, I use a loud voice all the time and I am angry most of the time and kids know it, then when I really get angry, she's just angry again. But if most of the time I'm using a pleasant voice, even in playful, and that doesn't have to be, oh, you still cute. Karen could use the, the most playful, silly voice. And it, it just was, if she called me on the phone, oh, darling, how are you doing? That's, that was Karen. That's, that's not me. I don't probably should develop more of that, but I can have a pleasant voice so that again, if I say, whoa, what's going on here? Their brain engages, right? And if we can teach parents that, and when they do have an explosion, they just go back and do a redo. Oh my gosh, that was not the right, we gotta redo. What I meant was, I'm really tired tonight. Let's do this differently, whatever. Do redos, we need to do redos for ourselves. What else is in there? Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Okay, this part when everyone is calm and regulated. Um, if your kids are on the floor or they're talking back to you or they're just shut down, then nothing's going in. Nothing is going in, but just blah, 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 blah. I have a son that's 51 and he talked, again, as they're learning this, I go, yeah, mom, that was when, you know, y'all would talk. And after a few words, it would sound like those, the adults on the Charlie Brown cartoons. Wah, 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 wah. What was going in? Nothing. Um, he's my practice kid. I was telling that. Sorry. He's a good dad, though. So <laughs> he's a good guy. Um, it's really important because you think about when you're really angry, you don't really want people to say, you just, you're okay. You don't want, you know, just, just you want them to have a calm voice or a presence. And so then later, we're going to, I, and Karen just talked about going back to the scene of the crime. I always like as soon as possible, if we had this blow up and we did this, we're gonna go back and say, okay, let's go back. You know, you wanted a toy, but today we can't have a toy. So let's think about what you're gonna get next time you come in here. But how do you feel when you can't get a toy? And so we're gonna practice that. So when you can, what's something you could do that would be, be easier and you wouldn't have to get down on that dirty floor or whatever. And so that's how we work this out with my grandson. Is, Sometimes we're going to come in here, we're only going to buy groceries, we're not going to go to the toy department, so what are we going to do? And I want to tell you, Walmart is one of the most sensory, unfriendly places you can take mm -hmm. a sensory kid or an adult. My husband hates, hates to go in there. Loud, bright, there's lots of people, bright, bright lights, all of this stuff I can see that I can't have, cupcakes and candy bars and bright and toys. So get them ready, prep them. Um, not when they're, you know, if, if you argue with a kid that's having a knockdown drag out, you are just spitting in the wind. 
Okay, we want to get them regulated. Regulating, uh, I'm going to pull this up and we're going to listen. Um, I really want you to hear this. No, let's, let's see. Is it going to play? Because she's just a fan of her. I wish everybody could be standing in front of her or sitting with her on the screen. She's a She would this is just, and when you hear that, well, it's not coming up, but I don't want you to see this as a script, but I want you to see this as a way we want to think. So this ideal response is going to give you the acronym. And so process that and how you would feel about that. <coughs> We've developed in our work an acronym to guide parents. It's the ideal response for discipline. I stands for immediate. D stands for direct. E stands for efficient. A stands for action-based. And L stands for leveled at behavior, not at the child. So ideal. I immediate. We know that if you respond to a child's behavior, good or negative behavior, within three seconds they will learn. So when the child does something good and you say, wow, that was nice using good your words, or that was such a good show and respect, or wow, I love it when you look at me with those beautiful blue eyes. When we do that within three seconds, or when a child needs to be redirected and they say something harsh and we say, well, let's try it again. If we say it immediately, we know from brain research a child will learn. If we do it direct, we ask parents to be within three feet of your children, that's where I could reach out and touch my child. So direct means that when I talk to my child and I say, tell me about your day, I'm going to be my body poised towards their body and my eyes and my full attention to them. I am fully present to that child and I'm asking them to be present to me. My eyes are there for them. I might reach and touch their shoulder. That child's going to connect to me. Also, when I need to redirect a child or correct a child or even discipline a child, I might say, give me two hands. Now, do you want to try that with respect? I'm not going to lob words at the child. Hey, go make your bed. Hey, stop doing that. I'm going to go to the child or bring the child to myself. And I'm going to be immediate and direct. I'm going to be efficient. We have a lot of parents who are going after a mosquito with an elephant gun. So the child does something, something minor, and the parent overreacts or reacts too harshly. And so what we say is be efficient. And we actually use what we call levels of response. And so we have four levels of response. And a low-level response, the child might say, I'm not doing that. And you might say to the child, are you asking me or telling me? Oh, could I please not do that? Okay, that was good asking. So I can use playful engagement and redirect a child most of the time. And then if a child moves on into, well, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to do that. And I might use choices. Sweetheart, you've got two choices. Now, again, I'm immediate and direct. You've got two choices. You can either color with the pencils or color with the crayons, but you can't use the markers. If that was what the child was saying, for example. So I might use choices. Then I might use compromises. And actually, in terms of being efficient, some parents find it's counterintuitive because something that we do, a, a, a child might say, um, you're stupid and you're ugly and I hate you and I'm not going to the library. Or I'm not going to bed, and they've just done all this mouthy stuff. Well, they're, they look like a pretty high challenge. I'd call that a level three challenge. But I might be able to meet that level three challenge without starting a nuclear race. I might be able to say, if you're asking for a compromise, try it again and give me good words. And the parent will say, well, why would you give that kid that was mouthy a compromise? And I would say, because my goal is to give that child voice and to connect with them and to do shared problem solving with them. So the child might go like, 
okay, could I please not go to the library? It's really boring. Well, sure, that was good using your words. Thanks for using those good words with me. In every case, I've been efficient. I haven't used force. I don't need force. I have relationship. So our, our discipline style on the ideal response is immediate, direct, efficient, action-based. We know from brain research that there's something called a sensory neuromotor loop. What it just means in common terms is, if I do the thing I heard about, I have a, a body memory for it. And so when a child does the wrong thing, they have a body memory for the wrong thing. And my goal as a person who wants to connect and empower my child, I want to give my child the body memory for the right thing. So when a child, if I've got something in my hand and a child grabs a pencil out of my hand, I say, whoa, stop. Put that back here now. Now my voice may change, my demeanor will change, my words get slower. I am no nonsense about this kind of behavior. I'm not permissive about bad behavior. But I have a goal to reconnect and to guide this child to empower them. And so I say to that child, put it here now. Now I don't take it back from them. I want them to have body memory to give it to me. So I say, here, now. And if the child resists, I might wait. I'm counting to myself because I know my children are slower to respond because their brains are different. So inside I'm going one, two, three, here, now. And so I'm slower in my voice, a little bit louder, a little bit lower in my tone. And my, and my cadence is slowed. And the child puts that in my hand. Now I'll say, thank you. Now, do you want my pencil? And if the child says yes, I'll say, give me good words and ask for it. And they'll say, mom, can I use the pencil? Or Miss Karen, can I use the pencil? Whatever child it is. I'll say, of course you can. That was great asking. Here you go. Give me five. Now, that child has the, the motor memory for doing the right thing. And now the path that was to the right thing. Now, when we start out, and I just have to be honest, I, I understand with the parents, the path to the, to the negative behavior might be a eight lane freeway. And the path to the behavior you want might be a little machete chopped jungle vine bridge somewhere in the dense forest. But every time my child practices with me, action-based practice with me, they chop away some more vine and this little jungle path can also become a freeway. And the last thing in our ideal response is clearly leveled at behavior, not at the child. So when it's over, I want three things. I want the behavior to be changed or corrected. I want the child to be more connected to me than they were before. And I want the child to be content because they succeeded and I know that I'll be content because I helped them. It will take a while to get to that continued place, but if we can get there, um, this power. And, I, and I'm going to send Jared that ideal response. I know some of you are writing it down. And I also, I think one of the posters I gave you was the ideal, and you can copy that. Um, because it's colorful, it's so colorful. So let's see, oh, there was some other, yeah. There, the uh, <clears throat> levels of response, she goes through, uh, and if we had, I think we'd do this, but uh, where, you know, sometimes we have to be up here and you heard her voice, uh, but if we can always go in, if, the, if playful, in other words, not, when I say playful, that's not like, you, you know, clown stuff, that's like, oh, who's, really so upset that's not you need to calm down mm -hmm. so playfulness just is what i'm doing is i'm coming in kind of underneath and i'm going to try to nip it before you know if i can't if that's not working then you have to go whoa whoa mm -mm. here's remember what we do and whatever you've established and again we would work on some of that so um we're just going to stop on that right now so that we can kind of since we're just about out of time Again, she kind of put all that that we had just talked about in in place and understanding that this immediacy is, is if we're constantly saying we're going to deal with that tomorrow, 
first of all, we probably don't know ever either, but it's no longer with them. So, you know, when, when a kid comes home from school and I got in trouble at school and said, what'd you do? And I'm like, I don't remember. They probably don't because they're probably gonna want to, but <laughs> just saying, you know, understand that in school today and tell them what they're supposed to remember. I, I, we have a real block with that. Like, you're gonna tell me what you did and you're gonna say you're sorry. Why don't we say, let's fix it? Because we want them to eventually get to that apology and learn how to do that and do that immediately. But sometimes we've got to just calm down the brain. One of the things that the, you have a picture of the, yeah. I found this one online. And, and so what I like about this one, I sort of give it is that it's, it sticks on the fridge. And the, the ones we use, like the, the engine plate. Okay. So uh, this one was one I used that was mine. And, and what I had kids do is we've got to learn about our bodies. And so we've got to teach them what the blue is. I can be tired. Pretty sad. Um, this is some stuff kids have told me. Sick. And then I have them tell me what helps them because we, we're going to learn about, you know, this was stretching. So we learned about stretching our bodies, calming ways to do that. Yoga is great. Learning just that basic. Uh, there's a lot of good yoga things for kids. And it, that's my level of yoga anyway. So learning <laughs> that, I can help them. Um, you know, healthy snack and water. Uh, and then angry, the red is can be angry or even um, excited. I just went to a birthday party and my brain's going, Whoop. I cannot pull it down. When I used to take my grandkids to Chuck E. Cheese, geez, we go outside and we push the wall. Because before we did that, we are pushing the wall like this, as hard as you can, it's proprioception and it, It'll tire you out anyway, but you'll feel it. You'll feel it in your muscles. And but before than that, they're gonna fight over those nicely expensive toy you get from right that they save their coupon. Like that was mine. No, that was mine. You know. So when we started pushing the wall, and I said, "Are you ready to get in the car? Do we need to do some more?" We need my blessed grandchildren know all about this common stuff. So they knew. They could tell me. And then I could say, we're going to get in the car and we're going to get a refreshment and we're going to ice cream, whatever. So, right. Let them know you're willing to do that. Now, not every day, but if I, if, if it's a good day, we're going to have, well, maybe it's a bad day. I used to pick kids up when I went to the children's home and take them to Sonic Happy Hour. I can afford that. And it would be the kids that were struggling as they get in my car and we could sit there and talk about stuff that they would have never told me if we had sat in my office. Green, of course, is where we want to be. So, but identify that. It's like I feel content. Maybe that's a word we could practice. Or I'm calm. Or I just I feel good. I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had one of my kiddos that I work with. Put, he wanted yellow right here. Well, that's the good thing about making it. And even on this one, you could have them do their own thing. Because he said, "I'm not always over here." Or it was mostly over here, but. Sometimes I'm in the yellow. So that was a good thing. We could put things that would keep him from going here. And this is another one that I love because he was able to tell me that these are the emotions he's having. And he, he could use this to tell me where he was. Don't limit to this. You're going to find you have some artistic kids that can tell you things about them by color and drawing if they're artistic. I'll, uh, I've had them draw lines and this is what, when I'm purple, this is happening and I'm talking to this person. Put that out there because then they can tell you exactly where they are. The, the goal of this is for them to be able to go and this one they can point, I'm really low today. Now, if they're coming in from school, they're tired. But maybe they're low and they're always hiding out. You know, I'm just, I feel low most of the time. So again, I, I think that's a harder thing to overcome for me because I have to really dig a lot. What's really going on? Nothing. Everything's good. Right? And then they go and do something they shouldn't do. Okay. It is now 129. Um, and uh, there is so much. And I want you to encourage you, empower you to go and look at some of these other ones because I think they'll they'll help you. You just go to YouTube, TVRI YouTube, and if there's a specific thing, put that on there and that'll come up first. You'll get a lot of other things like I know this with sleep. There's other people that 
and there's probably some really good stuff out there, but her, but that'll pop up. There's some things for school. There's every, every now there's videos for just about any, any walk of life, anybody that's dealing with whatever. So, and I'll get those to you. Okay. All right. Well, thank y'all for letting me be here. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you.